One of which is I am your official leader and, uh, for, and representative from Bethel University. And uh, so I just want to welcome you to Bethel University, which is the only university you know of that is run by the people for the people. We, uh, <coughs> not only do we think it's cool to learn the things and share them with each other, but we, and part of why we do this is for people to make connections with one another. Um, one thing we, we like to, to um, say is that, that you know, education is a vehicle through which we do community building. But the goal is community building, not necessarily education. So for that, for that uh, reason, what we want to do is well, I encourage everyone to, to serve, engage, uh, chat, and, and make connections amongst oneself each other. We also, of course, want uh, it to be a, a productive but respectful um, discourse that happens here. And so uh, um, you know, we hope, hope that people will, will do so. We encourage you to take photos during the class and send them to us at Bethel University VT at Gmail uh, so we can use them when we have our graduation party. We often you know, have a running show of that and we so we'd love for you to do that uh if someone does not want their photo taken though uh, you know please speak up and also the person taking their photo please respect that um, <clears throat> so who all of you registered in advance to come all right so uh we'll just want to get names who are you and i'm ken Kaplan. Did you just register really recently? Yeah, I, uh, I sent an email. Yeah, so. we got your email. Okay. okay. All right, you sent an email. Yeah. But, okay, so as long as we got you. I, know there. I didn't see you on the thing I printed out in a while. <laughs> All right, and because so we don't get uh, uh, apparently, like, like all schools, we're keeping attendance. And, uh, uh, so. All right, and uh, if you, if Firewise, we want that. If you want to get on our email list or notifications, anything like that, promise we don't spam you. If anything, we send too few emails out. Um, so, uh, but if you want to be notified of things, you know, sign up over there. Just sign up over there. Thank you. I also want to remind you that uh, we do have sort of a mid-semester event, uh, which we. Uh, just recently been putting together, and that's going to be on the 23rd of March, if I recall, Saturday. Uh, and it's going to be, uh, I think we're calling it the bug, which is a, a moth-like entity uh, that we're going to be having for people doing some storytelling. Is that correct? Do yes. I get all the details mostly? A moth-like evening of storytelling. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to know why it's called the bug, you have to come here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. If you want to know why it's specifically called the bug, there is a story about that. And, and maybe somebody in this room will tell it. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, finally, there's our graduation event, which is scheduled for Sunday, April 7th at 4 p.m. right here. Uh, as always, it'll be a potluck. Um, we usually supply cake, and you bring yourself and your family, and if you can, a dish to share. And graduation is always a lot of fun. We have a variety of Things. How many of you been to our graduation? Yeah, would you say it was fun? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we hope you will you will join us. This is our tenth tenth birthday, and uh, so uh, you know, so we're pretty excited. All right. And did I miss any other piece of information? Looking at the at the the Bethel University crew over there. Oh no, we did. We just do something. Okay. You got yeah, spring, break, spring break party is here as well. Yeah. In this room. Yeah. We're on our email list. You guys showed up. <laughs> we were. We need the full experience. Yeah. <laughs> we were li literally working out the details of spring break mm -hmm. Monday. Yeah. So, uh, so, um, and so, and with that, I want to introduce our speaker. And before I introduce our speaker, I, I'm a. Well, my other hats is I'm a representative uh, for the town of Bethel, Stockbridge, Rochester, and Hancock uh, to the state legislature. And uh, earlier this year, uh, Kevin came to a presentation uh, for our committee and, and found it very informative, very uh, thought-provoking, and, and, and yeah, just inspiring in a lot of ways. So I really am glad that he was able to come and join us. And, uh, 
So I'll, I'll keep. Which committee? I'm on House Commerce and Economic Development. And uh, so, which fits right into somewhat what Kevin's going to talk about. So I'll give you a little bio on Kevin. Kevin grew up in Vermont and is looking forward to growing old here too. Uh, don't look too quickly, some of us. Uh, 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 he's the son of immigrants, spent most of his early years living and learning in Burlington. He's a graduate of Middlebury College where he studied the environment and education while also competing in track and field. Uh, prior to joining the Vermont Futures Project, he worked at the University of Vermont where he led efforts in recruiting for diversity, academic advising, communications, community engagement, and economic development, and strategic planning. He's now the executive director of the Vermont Futures Project, a nonpartisan organization that's working to answer the mission question, how can we use data, and that's an important piece of this talk, I believe, how can we use data to support the evolution of Vermont's economy towards a thriving future with opportunity for all. In 2023, he was named the Distinguished Citizen by Champlain College and an 802 Diplomat by the Vermont Council on World Affairs, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, and thank you to all of you for being here and welcoming me to your community. Um, I was speaking with, with Rebecca prior to the start and saying how I was so jealous to hear there was cheerleading and pie yesterday for town meeting day. That should happen everywhere. Um, so first order of class, you all did the required reading, right? No. <laughs> um, education is part of my background. Um, I had the privilege of teaching ninth grade earth science in the town of Middlebury after I graduated. Um, and that was such a formative experience for me. Uh, I love the opening to Bethel University and talking about education as a way for community building, for people to share their experiences and exchange ideas. Um, so that's why I'm very thankful to be part of this engagement tonight. Now, um, Kirk said, I'm, I'm the son of immigrants. I'll share a little bit more about that piece of my story and I, I definitely bring that perspective into my work as well. So my parents came to Vermont, of all places, back in 1986. How did they end up here? Um, I have an aunt who married an American. They happen to have a home in Shelburne, and that was their one social connection. That's it. So my parents made a brave decision, a leap of faith, to come to the United States in pursuit of the American dream in search for economic opportunity to make sure that their kids had a better life than what they had growing up. And I, I'm happy to, to say that they were able to find it. They were able to raise three boys and put them through college. Um, and neither of them spoke English when they arrived. Neither of them had a college degree, but they were still able to find ways to make it work. Um, so my work for the Futures Project, I try to make sure that opportunity continues to be part of the Vermont story today and moving forward as well. So with that, I'll dive into the presentation and start off with this simple question, who is Vermont for? And it seems simple on its surface, but when we start asking it, things can get complex really quickly, and that's okay. Um, the reason why I like to ask this question, though, I don't think we ask it often enough, and if we don't have an answer that we define as a community, as a state, other people will answer it for us. I'll just share one example. Um, raise your hand if you know of or watch Saturday Night Live. So several years ago, they had a, a video about Vermont. That's what's featured in the top part here. There's a quote from that video that said, uh, Vermont, uh, it's a place with no immigrants, no minorities, an agrarian community where everyone lives in harmony because every single person is white. Uh, Yes, there, there's some humor to that, and for some people it also feels a bit uncomfortable to hear that and see that shared with a national audience, right? They, ha they have a very large worldwide audience, um, and that's just one example of how the story of who Vermont is for has been told for us. We were featured again just last year in Saturday Night Live again. So I asked that question, who is Vermont for? Now here's that mission question that was stated, and I'm just gonna highlight the last three words here, opportunity for all. Again, that's the piece that really drew me into this work, um, given my lived experience as a son of immigrants. Uh, but how are we answering this question? 
The way we're answering it in the moment is by working on developing a vision for Vermont's future, by creating an economic action plan. So the first step we took last year was to launch a set of goals to grow Vermont's population to 802,000 and increase the non-seasonal housing stock to 350,000 by 2035. And you may be wondering, how did you land exactly on 802,000? Um, I'll talk about that in a sec. But this framework of people and places as crucial to the future of Vermont, this was meant to be a starting point <clears throat> for conversation. So I've had the privilege of traveling around the state and giving similar presentations really to get the conversation going and to collect input and feedback. So I, I really hope to um, have a discussion at the end of my presentation and learn from each of you as well. Now, a good starting point for answering the question, who is Vermont for, is by asking, who's already here? This is where data can be helpful. So this is the age distribution of Vermont's current population. Vermont has the lowest fertility rate in the, in the country. So when we take a look at the um, blue there, can, can folks see that or is it a little fuzzy? I can try to adjust. Let me see. Okay, I think that's the best we can do. Um, so this top band here, that's, that's the children. That's um, ages zero to 15. And you can see our homegrown talent supply is shrinking. Census data includes college students. That's the light green. We can attract them here, but Vermont has the lowest college graduate retention rate of any state in the country. This dark green here in the middle, this is where we really need to focus on recruiting and retaining more people. Because as we get to the bottom of this graph, this orange band from ages 50 to 64, that represents about 140,000 Vermonters. And over the next 10 to 15 years, right, we shift these bars down and we see that the workforce challenges we're experiencing now will only be amplified because many of those in the 50 to 64 cohort will reach traditional retirement age. And as they age out of the workforce, they still have housing needs and generally healthcare needs go up. So this is a picture of where we're at today. Um, and it's important to ask, well, what if we do nothing, right? Because that's, that's a possible choice. Um, we can actually start to see the picture of what that looks like by looking at the data over the last 10 years. So in the top right, that represents January 2013. So let's say about a decade ago. And what that says is a decade ago, there were two job seekers for every one open job. There were more people looking for work than work available. And today, as the numbers have shifted, the ratio is inverted. So now there are about two open jobs for every one job seeker. There are more jobs available than people looking for work, right? And this shows that the aging population is leading to a shrinking workforce, and we can anticipate this will continue if we do nothing. I had a conversation with a reporter from the New York Times uh, back in October, um, then the story was published in November, but he wanted to know how is Vermont thinking about the aging demographic and its implications for the labor force? The reason why he wanted to do a story on Vermont is because Vermont is one of the oldest states by median age, which means we're on the leading edge of a transition that the rest of the country will likely experience if we do nothing. Um, and he wants to know, how are we thinking about it? What strategies might we try? Because Vermont is going to be a leader. We're going to be a leader in what to do or what not to do. But one of those things will happen. Um, so the dangers of doing nothing, what came up in our conversation is a shrinking workforce, loss of business, declining state revenues, increased cost of living. You know, a lot of the challenges that we're feeling now will be amplified and exacerbated. Um, but what really scares me is that opportunity begins to fade from the Vermont narrative. So why is a plan needed? I said that's how we're answering the question right now. Well, I typed in Vermont State Plan as a Google query, and in about 15 minutes compiled this list. I'm sure there are more out there, but this is just to demonstrate that uh, having a state plan is not um, a crazy concept. It's something that we've done in a lot of different um, topics, a lot of different areas. 
And it's okay to have these aspirational goals, right? These are all things that I think most people would agree are good to do or aspire to do. But what I found pretty quickly is actually we can't do all these things without an adequate supply of people and places. And I'll highlight that with data. So the Vermont Climate Action Plan, I was speaking with my, my friends at the Energy Action Network. And in their 2022 report, they estimated that for Vermont to meet its climate action plan goals through weatherization work, we would need about 7,000 more people doing weatherization by the year 2030. Then if we take a look at the current unemployment statistics, there are only about 7,500 people total in the state looking for work. So if we train them all to enter the climate economy, Great, we've accomplished one plan, but we've run out of people to do everything else. We've run out of teachers, nurses, firefighters. We've run out of people to install broadband, um, build houses. So that's why we have to pay attention to that supply of people and places. And when we look at the numbers over the next 10 to 15 years on the supply side, there were only 5,300 12th grade students in the whole state last year. And the Vermont Department of Labor projects about 15,000 retirements per year through the end of this decade alone, right? So those numbers don't balance out. And the annual gap, when we factor in all these things, is about 13,500 people, right? Because when we talk about workforce, we're talking about people. And then projected out to 2035, the numbers got in the 800,000 range. And I will be fully transparent and admit I took some personal liberty in picking 802 as the goal, because drawing from my education background and educational psychology, well, goals are only effective if people talk about them, they remember them, and they take pride in reaching their goals. And 800,000 in a Vermont context seems a little big and scary, but 802 for some reason feels a bit more familiar and comfortable. Um, so there's, there's excitement about that number. Now, I've been talking about population growth from an economic lens, but we know a thriving Vermont balances the environment, the economy, and equity. So I'll bring in the equity perspective here. This is what the picture looks like comparing Vermont to the US. Um, Vermont is about 92% white. The US is at about 59%. And the US Census Bureau projects that by about 2045, the country will be majority minority. So Vermont is quite a ways off of um, looking like the rest of the country. So if we simplify the numbers here, let's say nine out of 10 Vermonters are white, and there are really two ways to change that ratio. We can do that through addition or subtraction. Subtraction doesn't help our workforce issues and really doesn't increase the total number of non-white Vermonters. It would change the ratio though. Um, I also don't want to be responsible for getting, uh, picking who gets kicked out, so my, my personal vote would be addition. Uh, and it would do great things for the state from an economic perspective too. So if we bring the equity and economic perspectives together, we can see that the future of the workforce, um, we know it's going to be more diverse than previous generations. And in Vermont already, many non-white Vermonters are participating in the labor force at higher rates than the state average. Now, the Federal Reserve ran a simulation to estimate what would be the economic impacts of closing racial gaps in the labor market. And their estimate was that between 2005 and 2019, if racial gaps had been closed in the labor market for Vermont specifically, um, it amounts to about $150 million annually in GDP. And that's, that's not something I want to lose out on going forward. Um, so from an economic and an equity perspective, Vermont needs more people. But there's another side to the story that we also need to be aware of and help to tell, which is more people need Vermont. Um, and that's where I want to bring in the environmental lens. So I mentioned earlier um, the, the background in education. I was also an environmental studies major at Middlebury. Um, and one of the things that has really stood out to me in the state climate action plan is this language down here that says Vermont will need to prioritize helping the people who will be most affected by climate change. Right? Now, climate change is a global phenomenon, so we have to approach this with a global perspective. So when we zoom out um, 
and just take a look at a national picture, we can see that climate vulnerability, the darker areas on this map are more vulnerable to the effects of climate change than the lighter areas. The Northeast is a relatively favorable location. That's not to say there won't be impacts from climate change. It's just to say that on a relative basis, there are many people that may need a place like Vermont. And I hope that we can take proactive steps in creating viable pathways for people to choose Vermont and to perhaps one day be able to call themselves a Vermonter too. So to make that possible, we have to talk about housing, right? If housing is a human right, it should be right to build housing. And in fact, doing so would help us move forward in terms of our climate goals as well. It's not the environment versus the economy versus equity, but we can bring these perspectives together. So this is from Energy Action Network. Um, they mapped out Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions and broke it up into different buckets. And the green and the orange represents transportation and thermal emissions, respectively. So those are the two largest contributors. And new construction can help reduce the thermal demands. We have a lot of really old buildings in Vermont. Um, and if they're constructed in such a way where it reduces the transportation needs, right, things are really spread out right now, then we can see progress in both of those areas. I mentioned the old buildings. We have 25% um, of homes in Vermont were built before 1940. And this is sort of the picture in terms of the housing construction by decade. You can see we built quite a bit in the 1970s and 80s, uh, but it's really dropped off in recent decades. So the housing shortage we're experiencing now in an acute way is something that's been building. And that's another thing we can do with data is to dispel some of the myths, right? I've seen a lot of attention on the housing um, situation in recent years, and I've even heard the refrain that, oh, COVID, the pandemic has caused this housing issue, but there was a 50% decline in active listings before, from 2016 to 2020 before the pandemic. And uh, like with most things, COVID just accelerated trends that were previously already at play. Now I've covered a lot of data, um, but I, I want to end with a couple slides on sentiment. So how are people feeling about what they're seeing and experiencing around them? This is a question that I uh, sponsored in the Vermonter poll a couple of years ago to ask, are you supportive of growing Vermont's population size to strengthen its workforce? There are more people in Vermont that say yes than no, but what really surprised me um, was I started digging into the responses to try to understand if there was a difference by age and I'll be Totally honest, I had my own bias. I thought that younger Vermonters would be more open to population growth for new people to come here, um, and I was wrong. And it's okay to look at data sometimes and say, I'm wrong, Action, it happens to me all the time. Um, so this is how the data ended up playing out. The youngest respondents said no at the highest rates, and the older the, older the respondents got, the more likely they were to say yes. I'm sorry, where did the, um, where was the question asked? In the Vermonter poll, it's administered by the University of Vermont Center for Rural Studies each year. Um, and it samples a, a representative sample of Vermonters. Um, the, I think the poll is being conducted in the next couple of months, the 2024 iteration. And I'm actually asking this question again to see if sentiment has changed. Yep, so they use um, census-style methodologies. Uh, Michael Moser from the Center for Rural Studies is the one who leads that effort, um, and he'd be, he'd be able to tell you much more about the mechanics of it, but I, I think it's a mix of different outreach methods from um, phone calls to, to text messages to digital, um, but it, it's pretty solid data and, and reliable methodologies. They, they try to mirror some of the census style um, methodologies. 
And I think the sample size a couple of years ago was close to 1,000. And how was the sample size solicited? Yep, so uh, the, I, I'm not sure exactly how the uh, phone numbers or emails get picked, um, but they try to um, clean up the data so then the answers are representative of the, the underlying demographics of the population. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about how, how this played out. And um, when I started reading the open-ended responses that went along with the yes, no answers, um, I started to see why the youngest respondents said no at the highest rate. So many of the youngest respondents were answering from a, a scarcity mindset. They were seeing population growth as competition in the housing market whereas older Vermonters are more likely to own a home and be insulated from some of the market dynamics. Um, younger respondents were saying no because they saw population growth as competition in the labor market as they're trying to launch their careers and build career success. Um, older Vermonters were more likely to think of population and workforce in the context of healthcare and the services that they might need to access as they consider aging in their community. Um, so when I started reading those open responses, the data started to make a lot more sense. Now, the last bit of sentiment data I'll share is from Vermont Public. So th they asked, um, if you were to advise an 18-year-old considering where to build a successful life and career, would you recommend that he or she stay in Vermont or leave? And 42% of respondents said, leave Vermont, right? And that to me is, that's scary. And that might have made sense a decade ago because there were more people looking for work than work available. But we saw the underlying data, that dynamic has shifted. Um, but the narrative hasn't. And we already have a pretty small pool of young talent, right, that's continuing to shrink low fertility rates, yet we're telling them they have to go somewhere else to find a successful life or career. And, and that brings me back to that first question I asked. If, if Vermont isn't for the kids who have grown up here to be able to build a successful life, then who is Vermont for? And some of what I found with kids is they didn't want to be 22 and be in some small town with no other young people around. So I, I can relate to that because I grew up in a small town and then I started my career in another small town and then I, I left for a while, but then I came back. And so that's what I talked to a lot of kids about was, sure, you know, because the other thing with Vermont is it's so small, it's so, it lacks diversity so much, with the exception of the Burlington area. But I was working with kids out in, out in the more rural areas. And, um, and so what I encourage them to do was to go out and see the world mm -hmm. because then you can see how wonderful Vermont is. And then the other thing that I ran into because I was helping first generation Vermont kids go to college is they were coming out of college and there were some professional jobs available but they wanted four years, seven years of experience and they were like, I had a Young man graduated from Norwich University, mechanical engineering. Couldn't he got second or third in the in the in the application process, but never got the job. So he ended up he went up to Maine to a more urban area and was able to get a job in engineering. And that's engineering. So it was like yikes. And that was quite a while ago. But anyway. Um, I came here to go to Marlboro in the 80s. <laughs> Never wanted to leave, but had to, because I couldn't find housing, I couldn't find work. My mother told me I was wasting my life, 
in Vermont. He told me to get out. And um, Marlboro doesn't exist anymore. But there are a lot of people who come to college here who reminisce about their time here. And they do return. And those people we've got to snag because they do have world experience outside. Thetford is full of people who were campers who have come back and taken over their family camps or just have such huge nostalgia for it that they return. But the other piece that I've been seeing is that because of the labor shortage, young people are getting advanced in Vermont faster. A weird example is the Dollar General in Fairley, where there's a young man who I've been talking to on and off for months who had no clue about me, but they pushed him into it because he was the only guy left. You know, and so I said, you know, you have some leverage here. You need to get a better pay scale and you need to get some of your demand met because they need you more than you need them. And, and I know the post office is another example. People are getting advanced because, you know, there's nobody else to do the work. And so they're really young, they're really inexperienced, but they're getting very real world experience right now here. And maybe that could be um, impressed upon. It's like, well, the lack of demand for people not wanting to go to work, or whatever the reason is, it means that people who do want to work could really rise faster. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'll wrap up with a couple more comments and then we'll just open it up to discussion. Um, so I mentioned earlier that this framework, these goals that the Futures Project launched last year was a starting point for conversation. And you can see already that people want to speak up, they want to share their thoughts, and I'm really excited by that. Um, not everyone agrees on these numbers or the year, and that's okay. Um, but I, I really like a comment that was made. I gave a presentation at the Burlington YMCA, and their CEO and president said, you don't have to agree with Kevin's numbers, but you have to at least agree that they're directionally correct. <laughs> and, and I think that's what this process is about, is orienting all of us towards a, a direction that we can support and get behind, and it's going to be the collective action from the local level that really feeds into a statewide vision, right? I mentioned earlier, this wasn't meant to be prescriptive. I want to um, allow for the unique strengths and assets of every community to be represented in a statewide vision. Um, what we do have to agree on, though, is this, the underlying numbers, right? This is the picture of where Vermont is today, and this should be the starting point for how we plan for the future. So as um, the Futures Project pulls together that statewide economic action plan, these are some of the things on my mind, right? If you want a thriving economy, if you want to contribute to climate solutions, um, if you want to make progress on social equity, we, we need more people. Um, I see people as an asset, not a burden. Right, that shouldn't be a hot take, but sometimes I feel like it is. Uh, people add productive capacity to our communities, they contribute to culture, and we can actually take a look at the numbers to estimate how many we might need. Um, and then from that, calculate a housing number too. So if we can create a, a collective goal that's directionally correct um, and start taking steps in that direction, I think we'll see progress in our state. Um, some ways that you can help this conversation itself is helpful, just sharing ideas and content, um, helping to amplify the work of the Futures Project. But for me, it's all about this last bit here. Just have data-informed discussions with people in your network, whether it's friends, families, coworkers, elected officials, thank you. Um, and again, I'll wrap up just by putting the mission question up one more time. My contact info is here for anyone that wants to stay in touch or um, continue the conversation beyond today. But I'll, I'll end there with the formal presentation part and let's continue having a great discussion. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. housing needs. And if I recall your uh, presentation, I, got, I think it was from you, maybe it was someone came after you, uh, but tried to take those numbers and break them down into communities and how many houses each community would have to build per year in order to meet that, meet that goal. And while you look at these big numbers, you, it's kind of scary, but when you break them down per community per year, it actually 
seem very doable. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, certainly. I actually have some of those here. <clears throat> so the question is really about like this distributed growth, that big number, 802,000. Yeah, if we picture that all in Bethel, that might seem like a scary proposition. Um, but the idea is that, again, if everyone's bought in, that there's collective efforts across the state um, towards that girl, a goal, one way to think about it is, what if we just split it up based on current population ratios? Um, this is the, the gap and then the annualized rate. So by county, right, most of those numbers are in the hundreds. And that's for population. For housing, this is what it would look like. I remember giving a presentation to the Shelburne Select Board, for example, and we got down to the municipal level. And for Shelburne, um, if we established a goal based on just the current ratios of housing and population, they would be adding about 150 people per year in about 75 houses. And the mood in the room totally changed because they were thinking 802,000, 350,000, and then when it went to 150, 75. Now the folks in the room started thinking, oh, that'd be really good for my community. That'd be good for Shelburne. And um, I, I don't have the Bethel numbers on me today. That's something I can follow up with. But I wanted to share one more piece of um, research. I, this hasn't been published yet. I just started diving into these numbers a couple weeks ago. But this was inspired by a conversation I had with the mayor of Rutland because Rutland has set a population goal for their city. And the mayor said to me, well, Rutland used to have tens of thousands more people than it does today. And it got me thinking, there are a lot of towns around Vermont that have depopulated where population has decreased. So I went town by town and found the historical population peak and compared it to the current population. And then I started adding up what I'm calling latent capacity, right? If a town used to have 3,000 people and it has 2,500 today, well, we know at some point in time it held 500 more people. And when we tally that up, um, if we were to return every town to its historical population peak, we would have almost 70, 75,000 more people today. This tells a pretty cool story, though, because you see that a lot of the growth has happened in and around Chittenden County. So that number is low because they're near peak populations. But then you look at some of the other counties and you see, oh, we actually have latent capacity. We, we know that because many of those towns used to have more people. Um, so this can also inform the strategy of where to focus certain efforts, where to focus strategies in terms of building houses, or maybe it's supporting business growth. Um, so at a regional level, Right? It doesn't have to be the same prescriptive cookie cutter strategy in every single place. And, and that's why I say having that collective vision allows each place to pick the strategies that are best for that place. I've been working on that too. Um, but specifically on Thetford, because that's where I live and because I was on the planning commission, and we were, we, our, our plan is aspirational. And the planning commission is supposed to bring the zoning regulations up to make it uh, more real. And um, we're supposed to find 400 new homes to bring us up to about 3,000. And uh, I started putting maps together. And three quarters of Bedford is blocked off to, due to wildlife corridor. We're right in a, in a crossing and there's, um, there's no water in the places that you can go. Um, which is weird because we've got the river right there, but you, it's not like you're gonna tap into that for drinking stuff, I guess. Um, but there's a lot of pollution from where the, the sand and the, the salt and the, the old, I mean, there's a lot of problems in the little area that is available. Mm -hmm. You can't build anything there or people are sitting on it um, or, or the business you know, conglomerates have bought up as real estate um, you know, investments and that's preventing people from actually building things there too. So unless the state decide, unless the state decides to um, to say that uh, you know b business investments can't be made in that manner by Wall Street, um, or that the people you've never mentioned the people who have third homes here mm -hmm. and do not pay as much as those of us who are living here full time, and yet they still take advantage of 
the plowing and the roads and the, all the things that we pay for on a regular basis. So, I mean, that's the boogeyman in the room is there's all these really, really wealthy people with these crazy expensive houses who have huge tracts of land. Um, that <laughs> get that reference. Um, and uh, and they're, they are not contributing. They're just sitting on it. Um, and I have a, I have a uh, presentation that I'm be giving on March 10th, which deals with some of this, so it's like a follow-up from yours. So yeah. It's kind of cool. Um, if you haven't been on housingdata.org, I would encourage you to check it out. It's a dashboard that's managed by the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. They've been a really helpful um, strategic partner um, in some of my work. But th they have a dashboard that gets into housing by type, by ownership, um, and a lot of their data is available down to the municipal level. More, I moved here to Bethel 10 years ago, but in Woodstock, and I think it's even gotten worse now, when I moved out of there, more than 50% of the homes were second or third homes. Mm -hmm. And so when a town is more than half people who are not there, it kind of screws things up. Like, who's going to be on the select board and the school board and on the volunteer fire department? So they've had to go to a paid fire department now and paid ambulance service. Um, there's just not enough volunteers left. And that was the answer that I thought when you had that first train. And who's it for? People vacationing here. That's what I get. And that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious if you've heard, I can imagine there's some pushback on this sort of the concept from people who are like, you know, we don't want Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I knew that would happen as soon as we launched the goals. I didn't expect 100% buy-in. Um, and I, I can actually share some of the perspectives that have spoken up publicly in opposition to the Futures Project goal, uh, one of which was this author who said that Vermont's actually beyond a sustainable population level and um, has suggested that we should actually be trying to reduce the population to 500,000. And one of the bits of data that really stands out to me when thinking about sustainability is greenhouse gas emissions per capita. So again, borrowing from the Energy Action Network's report here, Vermont um, is right there. So all the states to the right are states over the past 15 or so years that have reduced their greenhouse gas emissions per capita more than Vermont. And many of these states New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, those are states that have grown their population, added more housing, grown their economies, and they've actually made more progress in terms of reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so it changes the script a little bit when we think about what is a sustainable population level, because what we're doing might not actually be working as well as we think. is, and when I go out of the state and I go to other places, one of the things that's unique and I think makes Vermont a nice place to live is we have these small towns. And what I worry about is not all towns have zoning and some towns don't want to do zoning and they don't want to, you know, they're just going to, they, they feel like, you know, Act 250 is going to save them from sprawl development. And that's part of why I came tonight, because I want to kind of hear what are you doing to sort of, like my, even I live up, up now in Randolph and we're a small town and I want to infill. There's all this space in our village where we could be adding housing and it would allow for better pedestrian, bicycle, transportation and development. And we can leave that unique 
open areas outside. And I like the, the wildlife corridor. I think we're crazy if we just think, oh, let's plop down all these new houses on 10 acres. We're gonna, we're gonna wreck Vermont. And I, I'm sorry, but I look at Chittenden County area and I go up there sometimes and I think, they ruined it, and, but then there's then they they ruin it, and then they go, oh shoot, and then they're backtracking, which I'm really happy with South Burlington. They're trying to make a town center. They're but it, but once you screw it up, then it takes a lot of effort to get it back. And so I would love to have 802, but in a smart development way, not in. A, and I lived out west in Oregon where they tried to do these growth boundary lines around some of the big urban areas, but some of it, you just, they just come in anyway, and they just and, and I've got back since, and, I, and you know, going up I-5 the way it was when I left, there were farm fields, and, and now it's just like, and it's gross, and I just, I don't like that happening anymore. No, I, I appreciate that sentiment, and I, mentioned uh, that, or actually Kirk said it in my bio, I, I grew up here and I look forward to growing old here too, because there are things about Vermont I really love and want to see continue into the future. Uh, I'll go back to this and say, this gets us halfway to 800, 2000, right? And, and that's repopulating areas that have depopulated, so it wouldn't take creating much more new stuff to do this. Um, but I, I am working with a group of environmental studies seniors at Middlebury College for their capstone class this semester to try to help me answer that question. How do we get to 802 in a sustainable way? What forms of development um, can help us achieve that that doesn't ruin um, the ecosystem around us, which is a unique strength and asset of Vermont? Um, so they're taking a look at case studies, other examples from other places um, to help inform the work that's happening here in Vermont. Um, and at the same time, I also wanna share, so this is a, a perspective that um, was authored back in October that also started um, to discuss some of the uniqueness of Vermont and the sentiment was that more people may overwhelm that, whether it's the cultures and traditions or the aesthetic look and feel. Um, so I started to dig into the data a bit in terms of population density, and Vermont currently is about 70 people per square mile. Um, New Jersey, which a lot of Vermonters seem to like to pick on, um, is about 1,200 people per square mile. And if we grew from our current population to 802,000, we'd go from 70 to 87 people per square mile. And to reach this level of population density, our population would have to be 11 million. Um, just to put into context sort of the <laughs> scale of development we're talking about, I find the numbers to be helpful. <laughs> Let's hear some new voices. Let's go here and then here. Yeah. Hi, it's Sage. Um, so what's working? Like what's bringing people here to stay? Have you, have you found anything that seems to be Yeah. That's a great question. So uh, how many people remember the relocation incentive that Vermont had? That was less than a decade ago, right? And I still remember the headlines. Vermont is paying people $10,000 to move there. And that was because the challenge in that moment was trying to get people interested in coming to Vermont. And within less than a decade, the dynamic has totally shifted. There's demand for Vermont. People want to be here. We saw that certainly during the pandemic, um, there was an element of just safety and low population density that drew people here. But the pandemic also served as a, a reflective moment for society where many people started to consider what are, what are their priorities, what are their values, and where do they want to live out those values? And Vermont happened to be at the top of many lists, and, and we still see demand for Vermont. We see it reflected in the housing market. Um, so, to me, that's actually really encouraging, right, that people want to be here. I think we're going to see continued demand for Vermont because of things like climate change. I showed that climate vulnerability map <laughs> earlier, right, so 
This is another dynamic that's at play. I think um, there are folks that have moved to Vermont because of the politics of the state, and they're leaving other areas where they might not, as individuals, feel as safe. Um, another thing that has worked, I know I'm adding a lot of things to the list, is our colleges and universities, in a moment when nationally there have been challenges in terms of enrollment, um, our colleges and universities are actually doing quite well compared to national peers. So. I'm, I'm speaking purely from enrollment numbers. Okay. Yeah. Marlboro's dead. You know, Vermont University and then Vermont State University has changed dramatically yep. over the last four years. Yeah, I, I know there's... I don't know if those enrollment numbers are that good. There's some mechanical pieces that certainly could be increased in terms of efficiency, but if we just take a look at the total number of college students in the state that has gone up over time, so uh, the reason why I say I'm focusing on enrollment is I am thinking about this dynamic here. We attract young talent. Right? Folks who didn't grow up here are coming to the state. We're having some trouble retaining. This is an opportunity to me. If, if we can create viable pathways for people to be able to stay here, that would help. I could find that data and provide it for you. Yes, all, all that's available um, through the NEC, NCES. I can't remember what the acronym stands for, uh, but enrollment numbers by institution are all publicly available data. Are you tracking, so the state is currently also forgiving some student loan for, for college students who stay for at least two years. Mm -hmm. They get a total of 5,000 off their student loan debt. Are you tracking to see if that's going to, because it's relatively new, are you going to track to see if that works? Yeah, so it's a new program, uh, to your point. Yeah. We don't have the final data on it yet, but I am watching closely to see if it is an effective strategy. Is it something we should try to scale up? Um, it's going to take the combination of a lot of different ideas and strategies to be able to um, to grow the population to 800, 2,000, to actually make progress on some of the challenges we're facing as a state. It's not gonna be any single solution, so I'm glad that one's on the table, and we have to think of other ideas too. Yeah. Um, this is very stimulating, and I'm, I could, I'm tempted to ask a million questions, but um, could you come back to the slide where you talk about the historical populations of different towns, that was interesting to me. Um, and I just want to question, well, no, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, why you would care what their historical peak was and not their historical low? Mm. Um, to, to me, it seems like you're well, it's a form of confirmation bias, I think, if you're trying to find out what the capacity of that town was in the past as if that's what it should be. And I really question that assumption. Mm -hmm. it, I think you could just as easily come up with very different numbers for all those. And for all those ones that have, if you track it over 50 years, 100 years, you're going to see populations go down and up. And every time that there's an up or a down, Sociologically, economically, you're going to find reasons for it. Yep. Um, there's lots of reasons. And we've heard great reasons here why things that might be an incentive to, for people to stay might be stuff to attract people, for people to leave. Um, I look at that one, one of those first charts and thinking if there's so many old, retired people here that it's not sustainable, then aren't they going to start leaving? I don't mean dying, I just mean going somewhere else. They might. To North Carolina. And wouldn't that be part of the solution? To, to some extent, maybe. But my biggest point is that this is fantastically complicated. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I agree. 100% agree. <laughs> and um, my point about that, and Kurt, don't take offense, but you've been to the legislature, they were interested. Um, what, 
are they going to do with this? That brightens me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I see, oh, we have to fix this. We have to start doing these programs. And my experience with Rose and Sari is pretty cynical. The more you try to do, the more misguided it gets. It's just, we're not very good at engineering growth. What works is supply and demand and economic forces that are time honored. And so I'm wary about um, what the politicians are going to do with it. And I'm talking about us. We're the ones who elect the politicians. So mm -hmm. not blaming not <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so, yeah. so it's a it's a huge challenge. And um, my bias is we're not smart enough to do much with this data. <laughs> uh, I'll answer the first part of um, your, your question with regards to why um, I was calculating from a historical peak. And I mentioned it was inspired by a conversation with the mayor of Rutland. And there's also been some pushback against growth goals saying that Vermont doesn't have the carrying capacity, that we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the schools to be able to grow the population. So the, the reason with starting with historical peaks to calculate that was to say, actually, we used to have more kids in our schools. We used to have more people in our towns. And some of the built infrastructure actually can support a capacity, yeah, um, has a, a larger carrying capacity than what the current population is in many places. So th that was the motivation behind this calculation. Um, but you're right, it is, it is complicated because that calculation doesn't say what size should we be. And I don't think that's for me to answer. That's, that's for communities to answer for themselves. Yeah, like, like yeah. Brooklyn, yeah. they've answered it for themselves. Yeah, and I, I think it's good to have numbers as part of that conversation for how we answer it. So. What comes to mind when I look at like Windsor County, because that's where I am, is, um, and I live on the White River, that I have lost a significant amount of land um, in my backyard. And so what used to be the population, mm -hmm. there may not be the land there and, um, anymore, as much land there. And then zoning also has to do with that. I mean, we don't have any, but um, a lot of towns do. And then did I just hear recently that Vermont um, wants to like preserve 50 percent of their land. 50 by 50. Mm -hmm. 50 by 50. So that just decreases the amount of space, also. Well, doesn't that? I think that <coughs> kind of is that would hopefully drive the growth to more developed Sorry, areas, like yeah. she was yeah. talking about, like the current downtown, where they could stand some. About 13,500. So that, I guess, how confident are you in, um, or, or where does that sort of the number of like new jobs, right? Wasn't that a piece of that that's driving that gap over time? I guess one thing I'm thinking about is, you know, well, of course, with telework, you know, that does change the dynamic a little bit, but, you know, where. It, are you also looking at, like, where is that job growth occurring? So if the number is 802, you know, does it necessarily spread out just straight, you know, sort of distributed across the however many counties, or are the jobs growing in particular counties, and then, you know, they would have to maybe kind of, like, work harder to... And uh, the other sort of related question is, I'm surprised to see that, well, kind of surprised to see that there's, uh, what it looks like, 
two jobs for every person basically now. And what kind of jobs are those up under? You know, and I don't know how that will factor into attracting people here. Mm -hmm. um, but Lyft attendants. You right, know, or McDonald's, server, or, or McDonald's yeah. do, do you have that home yeah. people. Not in this presentation, but that type of data is available. <laughs> um, the Vermont Department of Labor has a pretty robust um, data set that's publicly available that gets into exactly what types of jobs are part of the current labor market and what they're projected to be over the next decade. Um, and they partner with the McClure Foundation to publish a report each year highlighting the, the top 50 um, high pay, high demand jobs. So jobs that pay above the state median and are expected to grow. Um, and they share that with educational partners across the state, both at the high school and higher ed level. Um, so trying to help bring that data into career oriented conversations. Um, and then I mentioned the housingdata.org dashboard earlier that the Vermont Housing Finance Agency maintains. One of the um, maps that they have is a jobs to homes index where you can start to see where are the jobs located versus where are the homes located. And there are some areas where there are many more jobs than homes. Um, I see that in, in my hometown of South Burlington where if you created more housing there, people would be located closer to work. It would cut down on the vehicle miles traveled. There are other areas of the state where there are more homes than jobs. And maybe that's where we target some um, business growth strategies to create opportunities that are closer to where people currently live. Sorry, what part of the state has more homes than jobs? Bedford. Yeah. Uh, many oh, yeah. parts of the state. Absolutely. More homes than jobs. More homes than jobs. Yeah. We have zero jobs. That yes. Yeah, that stands out in the data as well. <laughs> yeah. But there is a, a positive swing to the ups, the more housing than jobs, is that we have like 48% over 60, and they are starting to go, I can't stay in my house anymore. It's too big. It's, and so Lister and Front Porch Forum are really interesting, the difficult way to track data, but we have been hit by a barrage of people offering rubbish removal services. Basically, they come in and they case your house and they take all the valuable stuff and they put the rest in the dumpster. And so this is happening to older couples um, mm. as, because it's really hard for them to decide what's got to go and there maybe their children don't want to have anything. And so we're trying to figure out how not to get scammed by people coming in from elsewhere who are just like taking all the antiques and then throwing everything else away. And, um, but those kinds of houses, they have large, they could put ADUs inside or make them into duplexes because they're ridiculously large because of the different time. Mm -hmm. you know, big families, basically. Yeah, and many of the homes in Vermont right, were built um, quite a while ago. So like, let's say just the homes that were built in the 70s and 80s were created to um, meet the needs of the population at that moment in time. Um, when families were larger and, and younger. Um, and this dynamic of an aging population, one of the predictable um, trends is median household size has gone down. And there are Vermonters that are now occupying a home that may be larger than their current needs. Um, so that's part of what's captured when we think about latent capacity. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> did I see some hand, hand, hands go up? Yeah. <laughs> Yep, and that's the thing. It's if we haven't created new supply to meet the needs of our current population, there are folks that may want to downsize, then we get stuck with a lot of empty bedrooms in our communities. Um, and I'm encouraged actually by some of these numbers because if we can create enough new supply to allow for some mobility and people to get into something that meets their needs, um, then I think we can start to see some of this latent capacity get refilled. Things 
culturally, we have really short memories. So I'm really fascinated to think back to history and what we can learn from it. Vermont has changed so much <laughs> what it is today. It's by no means what it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And I think that's really helpful for people to remember and think about how much our population and housing have changed. Um, but I also have been thinking about this a lot over the last couple of years, and I see so many ideas that were in practice 100 years ago, 200 years ago, that worked. And we've forgotten about them, we've done away with them. <laughs> and I wonder about bringing them back. And I think about this too. How was Vermont housing all these people, practically speaking? Where were they? Where were the houses? Where were people living? Because it wasn't distributed necessarily the way it was today. And I can think of a few things off the top of my head. So they were living in houses with a lot more people in them. Yeah. Could we think about moving in that direction, which would involve building anything else? Um, Home Share Now is a great program that tries to match often older adults with those big homes with people who need somewhere to live. And they're often younger and can provide companionship for a little bit of assistance. But it's not widespread. A lot of people don't know about it. Um, there's an organization called Strong Towns that does amazing work on smart growth. And I always think back to one of the presentations that I've seen from them where they've showed pictures of you know, Vermont small towns and things like this and the buildings that we all treasure for their historic character. And they had some powerful statistic about how few of them would actually be permitted today. <laughs> when we think about the architecture that defines Vermont, like the front house, big house, back house, barn model. It's illegal almost everywhere. <laughs> These can't be built. So if we can take a harder look at what our regulations are preventing, where we could be adding on a unit here that really does fit and wouldn't be a shock to the system, I think we could add a lot of units. I think about where they were spatially, too. Um, you know, when we look at Bethel, where were the people? They're probably more downtown, density-wise, but we also have, what, five or six little hamlets? Gilead mm -hmm. is bustling. <laughs> there were so many people out there, so many people in these little places. Um, and a lot of empty houses now, too. A lot of empty houses. Yeah. Solid, yeah. yeah, but far more back then. There might have been a thousand people right there. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a question. I'm, I'm curious from other Vermonters, especially those who do live in rural neighborhoods, could you imagine seeing a little hamlet grow again and a concentration of people and maybe having a little store or having more there than there is now? Because mm -hmm. if we're concerned about density and sprawl, downtowns and villages are a great place to start, but I don't know if it'll be enough to get all those numbers. I, I, I think part of that is letting go a little bit. Like if we want to keep the villages, which I think is valuable, and walkability, and bikeability, but we might have to let go of some of those old homes to allow for density. And that's something that being, I, I think there's probably several who grew up here in Vermont as kids, remember that those houses or don't remember, they're still here. But we might have to let that go to allow for the density of growth to allow Vermont to grow. And we keep it in the village or the town, we keep it centered, but it's, it's hard. And there's gonna be people who don't wanna do that. And we can't force anybody to do anything but it's, if we want to allow growth and uh, allow Vermont to be the greater Vermont, we are going to have to do that. And that's going to be challenging on a like, feelings heart level, but somewhat inevitable if we want to allow the greater green to stay and not sprawl. Um, the villages are going to have to change and get a little more dense again, and they were dense back in the day. But um, but that's a hard change, especially with where some of those properties have ended up. So um, not that's just a comment. 
Yeah, change, change is hard. It's a, a word that I wrestle with quite often. Um, and it's also why in our mission question, we decided not to use the word change and instead thought about evolution, right? Because change can mean erasure. Evolution uh, communicates we're trying to honor what has been and adapt to the conditions of the world around us. Uh, but I do think about some of the historic realities of Vermont. A hundred years ago, 75% of the state was deforested and the population was half the size. And today, 80% of the state is forested with double the population. <laughs> and that in itself is like a remarkable success story that we should celebrate. Uh, but it also says that, yeah, we, we can actually do stuff that's healthy for the land around us and for the people living here too. We've seen that progress. So, um, not to encourage you to use like scare tactics or whatever, but like what happens if we don't, I guess maybe you address that, but like if we don't move towards those goals, I mean the housing one clearly, I, that's when I feel like people have generally kind of gotten on board because it's so apparent hear stories all the time about, I've heard, we live in Randolph, right near the hospital, and I've heard stories about the hospital having a hard time hiring doctors because there's nowhere we, for them to can't live. can't have teachers because they can't find a place to <laughs> so live. So the housing one, I think, is, but like, what if we don't grow the pop, you know, what, what's the downside of not doing this, I guess? Yeah, that, that's been the focus of a lot of conversations, asking that question. What, what is the danger of doing nothing? Um, here, here's just a, a short list, but there are um, other documents that I can point you to that explain the um, risks of um, depopulation, especially with the imbalances of the age demographics that we have. You know, the Legislative Joint Fiscal Office um, issued a report on population and demographics and what it means for state revenues um, and, and the challenges that'll come with a changing dependency ratio. So. Uh, yeah, there there are risks. Well, I, yeah, I think the, the sort of climate migration piece of this that that's I think that is going to drive population growth here. Whether over, we over the long want term. it or not, and, <laughs> and we need to prepare for it. Because yeah. yeah. people will see that. I've I've seen that map before, um, and I think I mean, people will end up here. Yeah, and I'll add a little bit to that, just based on some of my lived experiences growing up in Burlington in a um, community of new Americans where my parents chose to come here. They were, they were migrants, but I also grew up with friends from refugee families um, that ended up here not because of some choice that they made, but because they literally had to get away from something devastating that was happening in their home country. Um, climate, there's those dynamics at play too. We know there are people that have moved to Vermont because of climate change. They're climate migrants that had the ability to pick a spot on the map and had the means and the wealth and the privilege to go there. Not everyone has that same level of privilege. And I hope that we can be a viable option for climate migrants and refugees. Um, so I just wanna make that distinction within the redistribution of population due to climate, um, that there are some people that have choice and some people that don't. I have three kids and all three of them left the state. They were all born and raised here, but all three of them left the state. And now that they are having families of their own, all three of them have come back mm -hmm. and they brought two people with them that were not raised in Vermont. So, uh, so we've got a net gain there. Um, but the thing that really made it possible was the fact that um, remote work, that especially uh, my daughter that was the last one to come back, she was gone for 10 years and wanted desperately to come back, but her partner didn't have a job here. And East Barnard, which is a very tiny little village not far from here, was one of the first ones to get fiber optic. And that's what made the difference when Patrick found that he could work remotely here. 
with good internet. This company. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. He's on the board now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I mean, I think that, you know, there is that possibility. And yeah, kids do need to leave. You know, my, my three kids, all of them, they needed to leave to see what it was like someplace else, but they all knew that they wanted to be back here. Um, and they were lucky they were able to get houses and, and jobs here, but uh, I think yeah. that's where we need to develop it more, is to get these kids to come back and bring them a partner that was raised someplace else with them. And then right off the bat, we can double. Or not have people want to leave. Hmm. Have the jobs here for those that can't get away and want to stay and have places to live. Yep. That's important. And not feel they have to go away to get the world experience, that they can still be here. It's great to have both opportunities, yeah. but it's important to not forget the people that can't go away or don't want to go away and want to stay and they need the jobs and they need the housing and they need the opportunities to be able to stay here and grow up here and still be those people that want to be here too. And I feel like a lot of those people are getting left behind. And there's a divide that's happened um, of that opportunity. So it's great to be able to go away and grow and see the world but it's also important to be able to just stay here and be able to grow right here. Um, it's valuable. And I, I feel like I don't have all the data. I got in here a little bit late, but uh, I feel like some of those opportunities are being lost. Um, so I, I think that's important. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, it's, it's a yes and. We, we need to think of both um, the kids who want to stay or, or can't leave and the ones who may feel like they need an experience elsewhere and at the same time recognize that even if we did retain 100% of our homegrown talent, it wouldn't offset the workforce gap, right? Because of the imbalances of the age demographics and this distribution, um, I mentioned earlier, we had 5,300 12th grade students across the entire state of Vermont last year. That's not a lot, right? And the Vermont Department of Labor projects 15,000 retirements per year. So retention alone, even if we kept 100%, which I don't think we ever will, uh, <laughs> wouldn't be alone enough. That's why it has to be a yes and. It's both an inside up and an outside in strategy. So I wanna also, want also mention um, because I work with people in poverty, and the amount of evictions and no fault evictions that are happening right now, and there's nowhere for them to go. So that is a huge piece of this conversation. And the more people that come in and buy bigger houses and blah, blah, blah it just makes um, it even, it, it will increase our homeless population. So that, that could be a, a big part of the conversation. We need more housing. You heard a slide about housing, how it's being built uh, more efficiently or using different, trying to make it more efficient. I think there's some sort of slide. And Efficiency Vermont is trying very hard to basically have us build spaceships on the ground, that they're airtight and they've got all these gadgets and stuff. The only reason that people could get away with smoky wood stoves is because they have very, um, they had houses with gap hoses. <laughs> you know, they had very old, ricky farmhouses, which which blew wind, and that's that allowed the air to change. It is it is a million dollars easy to build a house. Uh, not all of us have a million dollars. I'm right in the middle of my third year of building my house, and there's no way I can put all the bells and whistles that Efficiency Vermont wants uh, into these things. And so when we're building houses and they talk about affordable housing, that's not going to happen if we don't get like box loads of you know HVAC systems that are mini splits or whatever that are cheaper because it's too expensive to build the nice. I mean, this is not 
this building that we love here, <laughs> this is not an efficiency Vermont building. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a complex situation, and one of the things I try to do when things get really complicated is try to reorient my energy and attention on what do I have control over? And I think that's a good question for us to ask around the state as well in terms of the cost of housing. There are some things within our control, and there are some things that aren't. Vermont doesn't get to set federal interest rates. Um, we do have some control over land use regulation and permitting processes. Um, and that may be where we should focus some time and energy. So if we, if we can make some progress there, will it solve the affordability issue flat out? Probably not, but it's something that we can do and we have control over to start making some progress. And, and I think it's important to not wait for a perfect solution because as we uh, sort of sit with inaction, some of the consequences will play out, and the problem may be even harder to solve later. The state does have control over allowing owner builders to do their own GC, and that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I do have control over that right now, but there is a big push to take that away so that um, specialized contractors of Gold Star are the only ones to build houses, and that would be a huge mistake because all those little they have a rule now where it just says, okay, if you build your own house and it falls on you, that's on you. It's not us. But the minute they start having um, inspections and things like this for people who want to live in their own houses that they're trying to put together themselves, then we're, our housing thing is going to get worse. Um, what you said, Kevin, was a great segue to my question, which is, how is the Vermont Futures Project data being used? Like, are people who are currently doing this work, BHC, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and others, and Act 250 conversations, are, is this data being pulled into those conversations? Like, how else are you beaming this and infiltrating into the work that's already happening? Yeah, yeah, and so I mentioned I've been traveling around the state and trying to get this information out to as many parties as possible. I've been privileged enough to be able to present a few times at the State House. Um, and moving forward, I'm working with strategic partners on developing recommendations that will help us achieve some of these goals. Um, at the end of the day, like I alone cannot solve this. Um, I often say I am not smart enough to write a plan on my own, nor am I stupid enough to try. <laughs> um, and that's why these types of conversations are so helpful. I hadn't even thought about individuals as general contractors. That, that's a novel idea that I've encountered for the first time today, so thank you. Um, we will be launching um, a, the economic action plan in mid to late summer right, with recommendations that we will then hand over to community leaders to try to create change in, in their own place. Uh, we will be handing it over to folks in the legislature. We'll hand it to folks in local select boards. Um, and then the, the idea is, if, again, if we can orient ourselves um, towards a, a directionally correct goal, whether we get to 802 or 750 or uh, whatever the number ends up being, Right. I think that having consensus on a direction allows us to take some of these incremental steps that might allow us to see progress instead of waiting and sitting and seeing what happens. I've been hearing the phrase, like, we need more housing everywhere I go for the past year. But when I turn around and ask, okay, well, how many do we need? Very few people have an answer. So I think by having a number, right, and um, Kirk, you talked about wearing multiple hats earlier. One of the hats I wear is I do some coaching for track and field. Um, and athletes will come up to me and say, Coach, I want to run faster. And I ask, OK, how much faster? Let's get a goal on paper and then create a training plan so you can take the incremental steps to get there. I don't think that's a concept that, uh, that is a concept that we can apply on a statewide level as well. If we can quantify what some of those goals are, I think we can start to put together the tactics that move us in that direction. Those tactics may evolve over time as conditions evolve, and I think there has to be flexibility for us to change those tactics, but still understand what the direction is. 
to use another sports analogy, sorry, I have a, um, a lot of athletics in my, in my background. Um, that's, that's how I got into education. But at any given moment on, let's say, uh, a soccer field, right, the correct action changes based on like where players are, where the ball is, um, the weather conditions, but everyone on the team has an idea and agreement on what they're trying to do. Put the ball in the net. <laughs> The, the way they do that in any given moment will have to adapt on, uh, based on what's happening. Um, but if we can all agree we want to get that ball in the net, then I think we'll be able to take the right actions. Maybe that landed for some people, maybe it didn't, but <laughs> it's the first time I tried that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, we heard the bells for 8 o'clock when we're supposed to end. I want to respect Kevin's time since you've got to drive. Tonight. Yep. Thank you so much for coming. Um, there are a few events coming up that might be of interest. Cynthia, do you want to actually describe your class on Sunday? Yeah, uh, sure. It's um, called What is a Pocket Neighborhood because it's trying to fit in more housing into small spaces that are tucked away. But nobody can decide what that means, pocket neighborhood. Some people call it a cul-de-sac and some people call it a mobile home park and it's just like none of the above. So I've collected all of the information, and, you know, mostly from, from this guy, pocket neighbor, the Ross Chapin guy, um, who started that in the 80s. And um, uh, I, just, I think it can be really fun. It's a discussion, but also with pictures to say, this is what this looks like. It is not this. <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. So, but it brings up a lot of what you're saying. And um, it's a fascinating topic. I can't, it's everywhere in the nation, though. It's not just here. <laughs> Um, yeah, so if we could solve it here, we could be a beacon to other places. So Sunday afternoon on Zoom, Bethel University class. March 10 through yep. 4, you can register. and it can be a little longer if people could stay longer, if we could do that. Um, Lila, you may know more than I do. We have an organization working in our area called the White River Valley Consortium, which is a collaboration of White River Valley towns trying to see if we all pull together, could we make a debt on housing? And they're hosting some intergenerational storytelling nights coming up to hear the stories people have about housing and trying to find it and what it's like. Do you any more about that? Yeah. Okay. That's what I know, yeah, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was one in Randolph not long ago. Um, I know they were interested in holding one in Bethel, maybe in some other towns, so keep your eyes peeled for that. You know, the Randolph one now is happening. Oh, okay. Tickets at the end of March. Still coming. Uh, and the third one I know is a really interesting opportunity coming up from a couple of statewide partners. Community trusts are one model that has made an impact in certain areas. Woodstock has a housing trust where they have bought houses as an organization and put covenants on them so they will always remain affordable or remain workforce housing for teachers or people working in the town. Um, and it's a pretty promising model to incrementally move ahead. So the Preservation Trust of Vermont and Vermont Council on Rural Development are starting a new community trust program. They're gonna be picking, I believe, 20 communities over the next couple of years to work with them on this. And it's pretty amazing help and assistance. So they will support a community in putting together a board and an organization, including all the legal business to set up a nonprofit. Um, capacity building and training to help these be really functional organizations and then continue to work with that group as they identify an actual project they want to do, which could be infill. It could be taking one of the big empty buildings in a downtown and really moving that into housing or something else. And there's a lot of funding attached to it too. So multiple hundreds of dollars. They're having a webinar coming up very soon. I don't have the date, but we can put it in a follow-up email to all of you about the university, about this program. So communities that think that might be an interesting solution should get a group together and see. So, any final words to you two? No. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.